Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Preeti, and uh, for hosting this event. And uh, thanks to the Holocaust Genocide and Interfaith Center as well. And uh, of course, Manhattan College uh, for making this venue available. I wanna welcome you to Confronting the Past for the Sake of the Future, the New Voices preview event. We thank you for being here. Uh, wherever you are here in person or somewhere out there in cyberspace. The New Voices Project is a nonprofit organization focusing on the moral lessons of the Holocaust through the arts. When fully implemented, it will involve a number of underwritten elements, all designed to enhance Holocaust awareness and education. There are three branches of the tree, as uh, Dr. Afridi alluded to. There are the literary arts, the visual arts, and the performing arts. What's new about New Voices? Uh, the visual that you're about to see on the screen is symbols the world entire the project's uh, featured visual by Amy E. Bartell. Uh, the poster is featured at Holocaust Museums internationally. The symbols represent some, but not all, of the ways the Nazis uh, categorized World War II concentration camp prisoners. Amy teaches illustration and graphic design. Her studio is in Syracuse, New York. The anchor component of the project the New Voices Project is the book, as Dr. Freddy mentioned, New Voices Contemporary Writers Confronting the Holocaust. Our publisher is Valentine Mitchell of London, publisher of the first English language edition of Anne Frank's Diary. Matthew Silverman and I, as co-editors, carefully matched each writer with a vintage photo also carefully selected from noted collections and archives to respond to, to confront through newly written work. Among other purposes, the book is intended to be used as a kind of text in conjunction with the inquiry presentations, which are primary to the New Voices Project mission. And you can find out all about the overall project and subscribe to our NVP update newsletter and pre-order New Voices at a discount, all at the organization website, newvoicesproject.org. That's newvoicesproject.org. The New Voices Project mission involves recognizing the international growth of xenophobia, threats to democracy, and the challenge of alternative truth enabled by social media. Instead of dealing with the Holocaust as a static historical event and only a Jewish tragedy, the New Voices Project advocates a more dynamic approach with a focus on the moral lessons for all of humanity. New Voices is a combination history lesson and inquiry into humanities and humanity through the arts. The book New Voices will probably be considered an anthology only because New Voices is a new thing without known precedent. The term construction better applies. The doors are the essay. The windows, these are the poems. The rooms, these are the stories. We're going to give you a taste of all of this and more during the next hour or so. We won't delve into the extensive research which brought us to this project as now defined. That is not within the scope of this event. Suffice it to say that using the visuals approach has certain merit for both writer and reader and balancing poetry, story, and essay in one volume does as well. While each element has its own important value, all the elements coalesce to produce an overall impact. The general concept 
of new voices calls upon a diversity of voices to ensure the power of its message. New voices includes writers of color, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, LGBTQ, prominent and emerging writers from around the world. New Voices intends to memorialize, conceptualize, and transfigure the silent witnesses of the past represented through the preserved visual record of that time, to render interpretive voices for our contemporary post-Holocaust world and in the process to universalize as well, so as to focus on the moral lessons for all of humanity. So again, I ask what's new about New Voices? For one thing, we take an integrated interdisciplinary approach involving scholars and academics, literary, visual, and performing artists, as Dr. Friedi mentioned, as well as communications and marketing specialists. Frederick Aldama writes that storytelling provides a place to experience emotions within a safe place and illustrated storytelling, which is really what we're doing in this book, activates a connection between key brain networks, including visual perception, imagery, default mode, and language. The ultimate rationale behind the overall project involves utilization of the arts, particularly the literary arts, integrated with expository and informational material presented in varied media and forms, as guided by, and this is important, as guided by relevant uh, recent findings in cognitive science, neuroaesthetics, and communications theory, all for the purpose of impacting personal belief and behavior and affecting change. I want to share uh, just one example of what uh, we're driving at with this project. We did a real world simulation uh, at Ball State University. Emily Doscalzo, who is a member of our editorial group, cooperated in that endeavor. She teaches there. And we uh, did a, a real world simulation using the new voices forward, which we're going to talk about later in the program. Uh, in the college classroom. And we did a white paper on that. And uh, this is, is a particular quote from one of the students who participated. And I quote, the idea of finding something that is happening today to relate and compare to the Holocaust is a good idea because people today mostly think about themselves and how things relate to them individually. So let's start with the performing arts and virtuoso violinist Niv Ashkenazi. Niv has performed with members of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and Juilliard String Quartet, among others, given recitals, for example, at the Kennedy Center's Concert Hall and the Perlman Music Program. Niv was one of the featured soloists alongside Yo Yo Ma for the sidetrack of the PBS documentary, Harbor from the Holocaust. And Niv is the only musician with a long-term loan of one of the Violins of Hope. Instruments that were owned by Jewish musicians before and during the Holocaust, saved and restored and again being played by contemporary musicians. So without further ado, here's Niv to perform an opening solo violin selection on a Violin of Hope.
Thank you. Thank you. We uh, truly thank you and uh, stick around because uh, he's going to be back at the conclusion. So you'll want to stay put for that. Now I want to introduce one of our 64 contributors, Sarah Lippman, reading her flash fiction work from part two of New Voices. Part two is titled Forced Labor, Ghettos, Extermination. Sarah Lippman is the author of, a, of story collections, Doll Palace and Jerks. Her work has been honored by the New York Foundation for the Arts and her work has appeared in numerous publications. Her debut novel released this fall. You can applaud. Amazing, terrific. Howard, do you want to introduce the image or should I talk about the image before I read? Uh, if you want to make a brief comment, please feel free. Okay. Um, okay, so this is this is an image of Hitler shaking hands with General Pétain, which preceded the massive roundup and deporta uh, deportation of Jews from Paris um, in July of 1942. Um, my flash fiction piece is called Good Girls. When the photo appeared in the paper, our mother went bone still. We did not, we did not know why. We believe the man on the right was different from the man on the left. Two mustaches, but the man on the left was one of us. What was the worry? We were French. We did not yet understand the artifice of belonging. This was our tongue, our bread pressed against the pink flesh of our mouths, softening to a paste we could swallow without sound. Mother's coffee cup trembled in its saucer, but we did not yet know all the ways men would fail us. Once I called my sister Simone a two-faced rat, but mostly we got along, stayed out of trouble. At night, we pinned our hair into little rosettes. Our father may have died in his smoking chair, but we were not yet versed in the rules of betrayal. Surely the men meant to protect us would never throw us to wolves. That is not how government worked. That summer, upon word of the velodrome, we felt pride before horror. The 15th arrondissement, the famous cycling track, home of the 1924 Olympics. Our mother sent us ahead told us she'd follow. We believed this. She slipped a necklace into each of our shoes as collateral. Simone and I had each other. Lattice and steel arched over us like an industrial egg. Sure, there were rumblings, a feverish echo, but the place wasn't even full at first. It was flooded with light. You could picture a fencing match, the clang of blades, bicycles buzzing around with pointed caps in furious circles. We felt nation over faith until the smell took hold. Soon there were so many people, Simone said, told you so. Told me what? Who were we to question authority? We wore smocked dresses and knee socks the color of city puddles. We told ourselves it would be a temporary discomfort. In the distance, we could feel the glimmering grandeur of the Eiffel Tower. Maybe they were stars. In our minds, we could see everything there in the sky. Some things are beyond imagination, but we waited and we believed. Hours accumulated, our bellies cried into the hollow, our cries dissolved into one deafening cry as men marched through in boots, refusing food, water, toilet. Men turned up their noses, men spit at our feet, men called us cattle and vermin in French. One man carted off Simone by the waist. She'd been running her finger along a smudge of rubber tread, a vestige of cycling glory, or maybe it was blood or shit. By then there was no telling. 
When she returned, she curled limply into my lap and I stroked her hair of wilted flowers. We were lightheaded with hunger. The room continued to swell until it started to empty. And still we waited. Long after we lost sense of smell, sense of time, sense of self, we were only bodies. We dreamt of profiteroles and sweet cream. Fields of lupine bloomed in our wet eyes. Simone took my wrist. Somewhere out the window lay the promise of a bus to a train and a train to the countryside we visited the spring before Papa died. And if we were good girls, if we did whatever was asked, the wolf man said, trust, he would transport us there. Thank you so much, Sarah. I want now to uh, share with you, we want to share with you just a very short excerpt from the forward to New Voices. Uh, the forward to New Voices is special and different in that it consists of a transcript of a series of conversations between Dr. Anna Ornstein and Dr. Joy Layden, a colloquy, if you will. Anna Ornstein is Professor Emerita of Child Psychiatry, University of Cincinnati, former co-director International Center for the Study of Psychoanalytic Self-Psychology, she was lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical, training and supervising analyst at the Cincinnati Psychoanalytic Institute. She has authored over 100 publications that cover a wide range of topics, including her paper, Artistic Creativity in the he Healing Process, which prefigures the emerging field of neuroaesthetics. She is a Holocaust survivor. Dr. Joy Layden is the author of 11 books, including the revised second edition of the Book of Anna, which is the winner of the 2021 National Jewish Book Award for Poetry. She is a recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Writing Fellowship and two Hadassah Brandeis Institute Research and Fellowships. It has been featured on Krista Tippett's On Being NPR broadcast, which many of you may be familiar with. She has held the David and Ruth Gottesman Chair in English at Stern College of Yeshiva University. And uh, so if we can show that very brief excerpt. So, Anna, yes. uh, uh, I am I'm grateful for our discussion of the general arguments surrounding artistic representation and memorialization of the uh, of the Holocaust. And um, I feel that you uh, have not only endorsed the idea that um, that this is something that's uh, permissible to do, contrary to some of the arguments that it's immoral or is, or destructive in different ways, but that there is a real um, obligation and need, which are two different things. So that there there is a um, uh, Jews are, I think American Jews are raised feeling there's a communal obligation to remember the Holocaust. And it sounds like you feel that artistic representations is part of fulfilling that obligation, but also apart from a uh, Jewish communal sense of obligation, that there is a human need to create these representations to um, enable us to do what it, it seems like are two uh, different kinds of things. One is um, to keep memory alive, but the other is to create um, 
present day experiences that connect the present and the future to what's happened in, in the past. So not just recording, writing it down, looking at photographs of it, but actually creating as Guernica creates new experiences whereby individuals confront different elements and are challenged to synthesize them in different ways. And in the act of that synthesis, this goes from being some, somebody else's past to being something that happens inside each of us in the present. Was that right? Beautifully put. Years. Thank you. I am You said so much, and I do this to my students also. They say so many things come out, and then I get in the way and I go back and I say, okay, let's take things one at a time. I, I want to make sure that we really think through them. But the, the I want to start with the last two things you said and then go back to talk about the way New Voices works and how this photograph is working, because you demonstrated many different ways that it's functioning. First, um, New Voices includes uh, different kinds of elements. It includes photographs. It includes captions of photographs, and which are two separate things. And in the draft that, that I saw, there's a big difference between the photographs and the captions. So you often don't know what the pictures are. You go from the pictures to um, usually a poem that responds to the pictures, sometimes um, a story that responds to the pictures, sometimes prose that's not fiction or poetry that reflects as you're reflecting now on larger issues or questions about how did this happen? Why did this happen? How does it relate to the present? So there are many different elements and um, I always tell uh, my poetry students that if you want to communicate information, poetry is a very poor choice of medium. And I think photographs also are a poor choice of medium. Um, so, in a, I, you know, probably Homer would disagree with me. He would say, you know, actually it worked pretty well with the Iliad conveying history through poetry. But really, in general, I think that there are more efficient ways of considering large questions of what happened in what order and how did this happen and sociological uh, analysis of the, the sort that you're asking for. And while New Voices includes some of those materials, it foregrounds instead this very, um, I guess, montage of different elements that do not efficiently communicate chunks of information or chunks of perspective about these events, but that instead ask us to um, relate the different elements and meditate on them and think about them in new kinds of ways. Ultimately, I think that uh, it is adding up to, I don't know if you uh, know the Woody Allen movie, Hannah and his sisters, uh, Hannah and her sisters. Um, I remember seeing it, but uh, I do not remember. I, I know I had seen almost all of the Woody, Woody movies. Yeah. There's, um, there's a, a bitter European artist living in New York played by Max von Sydow, the great actor. And he's um, sitting at home watching television and his much younger girlfriend comes home and says, what were you doing? And he's saying, channel surfing. And he's like, you know, he's uh, trashing American culture on this channel. There was this and that channel, there was that. And he said on one channel, there are these intellectuals saying, how do, about the Holocaust, how did it happen? And he said, they can never answer the question because they're asking the wrong question. The question isn't, how did it happen? It's why doesn't it happen more often? And um, to be continued, that just gives you a, a little taste of that uh, conversation. 
We want to turn to our featured speaker, Paul Vincent, who, who will be presenting a talk on his part one essay from New Voices, Interwar Europe and the Scourge of Identity Politics with reference to current events. I recently reread his brilliant essay and uh, it's so prescient as you'll see during his presentation. Each of the essays included in the book presents a certain perspective. This one is about the times in the Holocaust to lend an historical and geopolitical perspective. Paul Vincent is the Keene State College Professor Emeritus of Holocaust Studies and History. He founded and then chaired the Department of Holocaust and Genocide Studies during 2009 to 2017 and served as director of the Cohen Center for Holocaust Studies from 1998 to 2007. He was the Pincus and Mark Wiesen Fellow at the Center for Advanced Holocaust <laughs> Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And Paul, we're very anxious to hear your talk. Okay, thank you. I trust everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, good, good. Uh, I think tonight has demonstrated both the pluses and minuses of, uh, of doing things virtually. Uh, uh, my, my hope had been to be with you, uh, but uh, the coronavirus got in my way and uh, I'm uh, currently uh, isolated with COVID, uh, which is probably the best way to be. Uh, okay, I'm going to, to talk about uh, the course and the outcome of European politics during the years 1918 to 1939. Uh, and I'll do this very shortly, which uh, is, is uh, unfortunate because it is incredibly complex, uh, but I will, um, I will narrow it down to what I see as, uh, as, as very fundamental features, especially with respect to the New Voices Project. Um, many of the, many of the, uh, the, the complexities uh, are really resolutely tied to the terms of the Versailles Treaty. Um, although one of several treaties fashioned at the Paris Peace Conference, uh, many, uh, not only Germans, perceive Versailles as unjustly harsh, uh, labeled by the Germans as a Carthaginian peace, uh, uh, meaning what ancient Rome uh, did uh, to Carthage uh, in the ancient world. Um, Historical analysis has, has lessened the import of Versailles for, for many historians, yet such analysis cannot remove the perception, the perception that Germans were treated egregiously, uh, a perception that encouraged Britain's appeasement uh, of what they viewed as a malign Germany, uh, and also helped encourage the United States to really forswear European crises uh, during the interwar period. Um, often overlooked are two factors that I think are absolutely crucial to interwar politics. Um, the first is that World War I had seriously weakened both Germany and Russia. Uh, while both states remained, uh, uh, had, had, had great potential power, they appeared to many uh, in the post-war era as being belly up. Um, it, it should have been clear to everyone that they would not remain so. Now, a second factor interrelated with the treatment by, uh, by the Western allies, uh, both Germany and Russia rejected democracy and embraced totalitarianism. We need to recall that Russia had already done this in the October Revolution of 1917 uh, with their aim of creating a classless society. Germany in 1933 uh, uh, ends up following Hitler and focus, uh, focusing on the realization of a racial ideology. So those two totalitarianisms were focused on different goals. Nonetheless, both were totalitarian powers. Now, not discounting the importance of Versailles, I think it's terribly important, or America's pivot in the 1920s and 30s to a, a posture of political isolation, these two factors would be viewed as more urgent, especially in a Europe now absent a balance of power. 
they serve to form part of a framework for what will now follow. In the 1970s, the diplomat George Kennan confessed that he had come to see World War I as the great seminal, uh, a seminal catastrophe of the 20th century. That it took Kennan more than 50 years to draw this conclusion is significant. And that he draws it uh, with the intervening World War II, which was a much more severe war, uh, I, I think makes it even more significant. World War I took the lives of more than 10 million soldiers and roughly an equivalent number of civilians, uh, 3.7 million for the allied powers, uh, mostly in what was Imperial Russia and 6.8 million for the central powers. Yet, yet, the Spanish influenza epidemic, or pandemic rather, of 1918, 1919, killed more than 50 million people. While at a minimum, this number doubles the casualty estimates for, for the war, George Kennan makes no mention of the Spanish flu, let alone labeling it as a seminal catastrophe. The reasons I think are clear. The distinction, the mortality generated by the war was human induced, the result of a violent and premeditated bloodletting. Moreover, that experience, that experience evolved into something labeled total war. That is a war waged not simply against an enemy's men in uniform, but against the state itself, including the state's assets, including the state's civilian population. Moreover, in the case of the Ottoman Empire, the targeted civilians were often located within the country's own borders. That is the Turks genocidal treatment in 1915 of its local Armenian population, an episode that would prove a harbinger. The Great War provided a lesson for a widespread population. Ordinary men had the capacity to kill indiscriminately in vast numbers. With the survivors returning home to work in mines, in factories, to run businesses, to milk cows, to teach children, to raise families, World War I exposed a reality, both bewildering and frightful. It also dovetails neatly, I think maybe too neatly, with the idea that the war brutalized post-war politics. This is a thesis especially compelling to students of Germany, Italy, and the, and the USSR, uh, but maybe rather less so when one's focus is Britain or France. Um, albeit for anybody who studied post-war America, uh, one might note that post-war violence in the United States was also more pronounced than it had been prior to the war. Yet, Kennan's seminal catastrophe should be viewed, I believe, more broadly, not simply as a window on humanity's capacity for mass violence. What began in 1914 was largely a conflict between multi-ethnic empires, the, the German Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, uh, the, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, as the conflict progressed, exceeding what anyone might have imagined in 1914. Its character metastasized. Gradually, class and ethnic antagonisms subverted loyalty to the, to the empires. By 1917, the violence of the war was increasingly politicized. This transformation, Robert Gerwith calls it a tectonic, a tectonic shift this explanation, this transformation uh, uh, explains both the Bolshevik revolution and the disintegration of Russia's empire. But the Russian experience was prelude to the collapse of other empires, all of which recall joyfully joined in the war in 1914 to 15. The Bolshevik revolution moreover induced counter-revolution, a counter-revolutionary culture, not simply within the borders of the former Russian empire, but extending west throughout much of the European continent. 
the varied ethnicities within the collapsing empires had not failed to see their differences before 1914. However, with a few exceptions, pre-war visions of expanded autonomy within multi-ethnic empires rarely evolved into demands for national independence. So as in many other ways, the war produced unintended consequences. In a well-worn legend, a peasant born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, married in Poland, raising a family in the USSR, was living out his final years in Ukraine, never having left his ancestral home. Such was the experience of hundreds of thousands in East Central Europe. Among the tragedies that might be attached to Woodrow Wilson, the conviction of a suppressed self-determination had triggered World War I might be first and foremost. By addressing this grievance, the Great War would be the war to end all wars. Yet looking back, a key factor making life in interwar Europe precarious, if not always violent, was the specter of the nation state. The nation state is the logical outcome of Woodrow Wilson's self-determination. A modern invention rooted in the late 18th century, nationalism often espouses a utopian and dangerous goal of homogeneous ethnicity. Where actual or supposed ethnic groups believe themselves confined by unjust borders, or when a nation state comprises an alien ethnic group, seething resentment is apt to turn violent, whether to defend vulnerable members beyond a state's border, for example, Germans living in Czechoslovakia, Sudetenland, or to remove those deemed alien to a nation within one's borders. The resurrected state of Poland can serve as a point in example. Reestablished after having been removed from Europe's map in the 1790s, two thirds of Poland's 27 million population in 1921 were ethnic Poles. One third were Ukrainian, Belarusian, German, Lithuanian, and of course, Jewish. If the Poles aim to fashion a nation state, nine million inhabitants posed an intractable problem. Now, similar preoccupations tormented Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Italy, all three of the Baltic states, and that smorgasbord entity of Yugoslavia known in 1920 as the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. You might note, if you know anything about Yugoslavia, that the word Bosnian doesn't appear in that particular title. The League of Nations, which is a product of, of, the, of the Paris peace talks, tried but was really unable to deal with this ethnicity problem. Now, the fantasy of realizing an ethnically homogeneous politics that is the aspiration of evolving a real nation state was a lethal post-war preview of later identity politics. It might be deemed the overriding geopolitical agenda of interwar Europe, existing from the Baltic states all the way through the Balkans. Wherever that dream seemed either threatens or went unfulfilled, one encountered potential violence. And when set against the further reality of the Great Depression, the political culture in Europe was poisoned all the more, especially in small and insecure new states, which tended to threaten one another while being viewed as easy prey by Europe's larger powers. At the same time, ethnic violence also found outlet in Stalin's ruthless rule. In his effort to attain a so-called classless society, 
he purposely starved to death between three and eight million supposed kulaks. Kulaks was a group that was conceived uh, that needed to be removed because of there being a capitalist class enemy. This action should also be viewed as an ethnic attack. Well, the best known target of what is called the Holodomor with the Ukrainians, approximately 40%, that is 1 million of the Kazakh population also died in 1932 to 33. Now, when and wherever antipathy to the Jew focused ethnic violence, it was often undergirded by this specious claim Jews and Bolsheviks were one and the same threat. Empty as it was, this assertion struck powerful roots. In a ferocious civil war that ripped Russian society after the revolution, a conflict that's estimated to have led to approximately 4 million deaths, anti-Semitic pogroms were common and widespread, especially in the West with a comparatively large Jewish representation amongst the communist leadership, uh, anti-Bolsheviks stigmatized uh, the October Revolution as a Jewish conspiracy. Robert Gerwarth, who I've already mentioned, argues that anti-Judeo-Bolshevik card gave the whites something popular with which to identify. It led to outbreaks of anti-Semitic violence throughout Russia. Now this conviction was not limited to the borders of the old Russian empire. It reinforced uh, an age old narrative of Jews responsible for the crucifixion. Post-war antisemitism also dovetailed nicely with a pre-war pre -war fabrication. The protocols of the elders of Zion claiming that Jews conspired for world domination. This, this book had widespread circulation. As you can see, it was produced in multilingual uh, uh, editions. Uh, Henry Ford had it published uh, by the newspaper that he came to own in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, the, the Dearborn Independent. So while ethnic animosity divided, for example, the, Jew, the, the German, the Jew, the Ukrainian, and so on, it found unity and a common contempt for the Jew. Ethnic turmoil would transform, transform Europe in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Um, the 1919 dream of a, nation, of a nation state became a reality. Uh, followed by widespread and often brutal ethnic cleansing. Uh, for example, uh, in the border region between Poland and Ukraine, uh, and certainly amongst the Germans who had been living in what had been Yugo or, or Czechoslovakia. But with the collapse of the Soviet bloc in the early 1990s, uh, combined with, the refugee crisis, uh, with refugee crises in the early decades of the 21st century, a new version of ethnic turmoil resurfaced and remains powerful today. In our contemporary world, it's been labeled identity politics. When identity politics is perceived to either privilege or disparage one or more groups by comparison to others, the likelihood of violence should be taken as a given. Consider the Unite the Right rally of the 11th of August, 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia. You will not replace us and Jews will not replace us. Indeed, the word replace has evolved into replacement theory, another way of talking about identity. Uh, in conclusion, nationalism is not or should not necessarily be deemed a negative word, whereas I'm prepared to argue against any exclusive ethnic-based nationalism. For example, I find this concept of Christian nationalism absolutely abhorrent. Most of us, I think, should take comfort in an inclusive notion of nationalism, one based on a common embrace of the ideas and institutions encapsulated in the work of our founding fathers. 
And I think in many respects encapsulated in the teams that we send to the Olympics on a four-year basis. If you just look at the individuals that are involved. Thank you. Paul and feel better. We just have a few more things that we want to share with you that are very important. I want to uh, introduce another of our contributors, Cheryl J. Fish, reading her flash fiction work from part two, uh, part three of New Voices, which is titled Escape Rescue Resistance. Cheryl J. Fish is a poet, fiction writer, and environmental justice scholar. Her recent books of poetry include Crater and Tower, and The Sauna is Full of Maids. Fish has been a Fulbright professor in Finland and visiting professor at Mount Holyoke College. She teaches at BMCC City University of New York and is docent lecturer in the Department of, Cultural, of, of Cultures at the University of Helsinki. Off the yoga mat, her debut novel is being released this October. In fact, I think tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Cheryl, yeah. it's all yours. Okay, you're gonna show the photograph? We'll bring up the image in a minute. Okay. You're all set. Okay, thank you, Howard. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, the title of this um, flash fiction is My Grandfather, a, ref a Refugee Lined Up Outside the American Consulate in Marseille. They huddled. They waited outside the American Consulate in Marseille, uh, Place Felix Barre, to beg for documents. Hats on, coats buttoned, their stories already planted inside their heads. Will you grant me leave? Help me get out. I deserve to live. Some of them have husbands, wives, children. Some are alone. They whispered on the street or stayed silent with hands in pockets. They didn't push. Some knew the name, Hiram, Harry Bingham. He disobeyed orders from Washington. The one with the ear, the heart. He worked with Varian Fry from the Emergency Rescue Committee. Bingham was 37, the vice counsel who chose to break the law. He did it for that author, Leon Fuchswanger, sheltered him in his own home, and the writer, Harry, overheard Harry arguing on the phone with his superiors. He falsified documents and issued visas well beyond the quota. What about a humble house painter? My grandfather was one of those waiting. He came back each day, afraid to show fear, but his hands trembled even before he came to France. He thought about how he messed up the outlines on the stencils he was known for, he and his father and brother, for mimicking wood paneling on their walls, the grain and design their calling card. As they waited on the sidewalk, they heard about camps in France. Just the other day, police from the Vichy, they summoned certain Jews to one called Les Mille. My grandfather, Solomon Jacobs, young and forceful once he opened his mouth, but he wouldn't do much talking unless they asked. They gathered outside the large wooden door of the consulate waiting for hours. I asked myself, did my grandfather ever sing to himself? Hum, as he stood there, time passing, maybe his close neighbors hearing, sound escape? Later, he would join a Yidd Yiddish chorus in New York City, his singing providing not only an escape, but pleasure and no doubt memories. When he plays a beautiful and heartfelt Jewish metal, Lydie on his fiddle, oh mama, everything feels so good. I don't know the tune, so I'm sorry for that singing. He would sing in Yiddish in ways I couldn't understand beyond language. Do you dare to sing in anticipation of annihilation or escape? Not all of them even fit on the sidewalk. Some stood across the street, but in the photos I've seen, there is no sign of hysteria. Imagine if my grandfather hadn't gone. 
When we cleaned out his apartment years later, we saw postcards from his brother and sister who stayed behind in Poland. They wanted to know all about America and arrive there someday, but they remained trapped within impossibility. They became puzzling objects of death unanswered, details of their lives unknown, stamps on the card from towns soon obliterated. Harry's deeds were also discovered belatedly by one of his sons going through his papers after his father's passing. Harry didn't share his heroism. We also have this photo, a document that validates. Why did Bingham take the picture of the crowd from above? Was he on a balcony watching those he'd attempt to rescue from the Nazis or just looking out his window, stretching his legs between processing those hopeful Jews who begged for the right papers? Did he consciously gather visual evidence? reflect on the randomness and ethics of history. In 10 months, he'd helped 2,500 of them. I doubt he saw himself as a fine art photographer, although he saved gifted artists like Marc Chagall. They became good friends. Lisette Modell was an influential street photographer from the, that time, but she focused on the leisure class, the average French citizen out for a stroll or sitting on a bench in a strange hat making a face on the promenade in Nice. She became the teacher of Diane Arbus, famous for her photos of grotesque yet poignant individuals. What Bingham captured from above was the orderly cue, civilized desperation, a tender chaos he shepherded. Bless him. What were the odds, the chances that your ancestor made it out? I don't think anyone thought of fine art photography when survival was at stake. I search for my grandfather among the crowd and try to get inside his head. Of course, he's just another hat and coat from that angle, a lucky man. He never wanted to speak of life from those times. His face went blank, his brow creased, but he had that option thanks to Harry and whatever power beyond their control intervened. Thank you. We'd be remiss if we didn't bring some poetry into the program. I want to introduce contributor Barry Seiler, reading his poem from New Voices. Barry Seiler has published four books of poetry. His work, Frozen Falls, was a finalist for the Patterson Poetry Prize. He has received fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts and the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. New Jersey State Council named him a distinguished artist in poetry. His poem is from part four of New Voices. The title of part four is Aftermath. Barry, please uh, continue. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to imagine you out there. Uh, the picture you see, um, I hope, is, is not really a photo. It's actually part of a very, very brief film, about 25 seconds, that shows uh, uh, Bremerhaven and, and the area of the ship and the area around the ship. Um, and the poem is sort of extends out to that of it, called The Displaced. We see them standing on deck staring back at the old world, seeing themselves off. What they see does not show on their face. We see them, the orphans, the elderly, the widowed and the married, the borrowed coats and shoes, their names pinned to their chests so we can say them when they arrive. We wonder if they know their destination. We wonder if they know what ship to freedom means. But really, all they know is this. They are sailing elsewhere. Elsewhere is all. On the dock, the departed congregate. This is not the afterlife they were promised. This is not the old understanding as they understood it. Where is it written they must bear witness as the ship sails off and the living stares through them at God knows what? Where is it written they must pray, weighing in place, chanting the names of abandoned things, tattered suitcase, 
wind-blown hat, gold pocket watch, shoelace, turkey. I want, I want, please. I want to uh, introduce uh, Rachel Futterman, our new uh, voices artist, and ask her to speak about her prelude drawings. The prelude drawings introduce each of the four parts of New Voices. Rachel is a graphic designer and illustrator living in New York City. She holds a BFA from the State University of New York at Oswego and is a former student of Amy Bartell, our featured artist. So without further ado, Rachel, if you'll come up to the podium. Sorry, everyone, bear with my voice. I just had to fool me in a couple of days. Yeah, so thank you for having me here today. Uh, when I began my illustrations for this book, one word echoed in my head louder than any others humanity. Humanity during times when it feels most beautiful, humanity during times that it seems to have none of it, and humanity during times that don't even exist yet. With that word in mind, I wanted each of my drawings to contain not just symbolism from the Holocaust, but above all else, a deeply human element. Each drawing in New Voices contains a human base, and that is what I hope readers of this book resonate most with, that the victims of this horrific event were people, and that even if we have never met them, and even if we have no biological connection to them, they could have been people who look just like us. My work was also inspired by the few drawings that came out of the Jewish ghettos and concentration camps, impressions of a dark world that were stuck during rare and dangerous moments. It didn't feel right to me to create work that was particularly representational, colorful, or beautiful. I wanted to instead match the rawness of the original artists at the time who dared to capture the moments that cameras missed. Additionally, I tried to remain sensitive to the subject matter in itself, as a young person learning about the Holocaust decades after it happened, it is not my place to create direct visuals of the horrors that occurred, and I instead try to portray the darkness that these horrors left behind. It is an honor for my work to be shown alongside the work of the incredible contributors to this book, and what I learned as I created these drawings is what I hope readers take with them at the book's close. That though the Holocaust happened in a world that seems like it exists, it, is, it exists only in the past, Crimes against humanity take place globally every day in a world that is very much the present. We must not close our eyes to horrors that are happening in the world just because they're not right in front of us, because they are happening. The best books are ones that change us in some way by the time we finish reading them. I hope that the readers of New Voices feel transformed enough that they in turn help change the world that they are in. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you for your wonderful drawings, which are so evocative. I want to call on uh, Michael Work, who is vice chair of the New Voices Project Board of Directors. His, his background is quite unique and perfect for this project in my estimation. He has a degree in education, a theology degree, and a law degree to boot. And I'd like uh, Michael to make some concluding remarks and reintroduce Sniv to uh, do a, uh, a closing solo violin selection, a little different than the opening selection, I might add. Michael? Thank you, Howard. Thank you also to the Holocaust Gener Genocide and Interfaith Education Center and to Dr. Afridi for hosting us here today. Thanks to those who are here in person, those who are with us in cyberspace, and anyone who's going to come and see this in the future. Uh, we do appreciate each and every one of you being here with us today. And part of the, the whole idea behind this project is that we look back at the Holocaust 
as an event in history, but it's also something that connects to our world today and in the future. Some of the things that led up to the Holocaust happening, some of the historical factors. When we look at the world we're in right now, we see some of those same trends occurring at this moment, whether it's the rise of authoritarianism or the use of language to stigmatize, to caricaturize, to dehumanize others and reduce them to a label or to those who are against us, those who are the problem. And when we wind up doing that with our words, then we wind up the pathway to violence is very close by. And recognizing that and seeing the, the danger of that, but then also finding how do we push back against that in terms of how we go about our day-to-day -day lives, how we interact with arts, with one another, and, and with other people, and getting outside of those echo chambers that we often find ourselves sort of into through social media and companies that are happy to create algorithms to box people and put them against each other. How do we get past that and live as we share humanity? We recognize mm -hmm. our shared capacity for both good and for evil. And that's what this book does get into. I've, I've had the privilege of being able to see an advanced copy of it. And one of the things that is very exciting about it is seeing the juxtaposition of photographs of pieces of art alongside with writings, with poetry, with essays, to see kind of how art draws out a response from people and how we may move past the, you know, simply communicating information. And when we're in that information communication mindset, sometimes it's like, okay, I know this. I know what this person is saying. I've heard it before. Check, move on, what's next? But then when it comes to engaging art, engaging something, something other, it can kind of short circuit those processes and bring us face to face with something that we either have not seen before, have not encountered before, or that we're seeing for the first time and then seeing ourselves in a new way. That's the very exciting thing about this project is you see people, the images that have evoked reactions from the people who are contributing to the project who then bring their reflections and thoughts, their experiences to bear on us who then come into contact with their work through this book and also through events like this. And that is the exciting creative power of this work. And one of those uh, contributions comes from Nev Ashkenazi, who will be uh, leading us out with a, uh, another solo on the violin of hope. For those of us who are here in person, I believe we would hear him a lot more clearly, right? Could you guys see the screen? Could you guys see me? People at home and on Zoom, could you see me? Can you guys see me?
again, I just want to reiterate Michael's remarks and uh, uh, in terms of thanking everyone who participated and everyone who came here via uh, virtual means or otherwise. And uh, we hope this has been a meaningful experience for you all.